Lynn Cullen live in one minute. Welcome to Lynn Cullen Live at PGHCityPaper.com. Email your questions and comments to Lynn at PGHCityPaper.com. All right, just opening my Diet Coke. What a way to start the day. Okay. Good morning to y'all. Beautiful sunny, sunny day. Exactly what we're, we've been waiting for. Uh, what, what's wrong? Jess, why are you looking like that? There's got there are guys making noise in the hall. What do you think? I yeah, it's loud, but you guys can't hear it, right? Uh, nothing like soundproof studios. There, <laughs> it's one of the things when I got into broadcasting that astonished me. I assumed a studio was soundproof, and. I've never worked in a soundproof studio. I've never worked in anything even approaching a soundproof studio. So, I mean, it, there's, it's, it's a room. It is no more soundproof than, uh, than any room you have. You could just poke your nose out and let them know that we're on the air, which might astonish them. Um, so, hi, guys. Anyway, we've got, uh, we've got somebody coming in in uh, probably about 15 minutes or so to talk about... Uh, educational issues, uh, specifically No Child Left Behind, and, and uh, opting out, uh, having your child absolutely refuse to take part in the testing that is the uh, bedrock of No Child Left Behind. We'll talk to Kathy Newman, who set off quite a stir in an op-ed piece she wrote in the Post-Gazette, which has gotten a gazillion views and an awful lot of uh, attention. Uh, the big news today, happening just uh, hours ago, is the uh, death of former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady of Great Britain. Uh, you and I will be um, on the receiving end of adulatory, would that be, uh, remarks from everybody and anybody about uh, this woman. Uh, she made her mark. There is no doubt about that. This was one powerful woman who had no qualms about exercising the power of her office uh, and the power of her personality, I think. Um, as I am want to remind you on occasion and myself often, people are complex so that the efforts now to see her as some, you know, a exemplar of everything that a political leader should be and a wondrous being who saved Great Britain and on the other side as the devil incarnate, um, probably somewhere in between is, uh, is an accurate picture of this woman. If you are progressive by nature, liberal by nature, you're going to have a jaundiced view of her politics, certainly. And uh, in Great Britain, um, she is about as uh, divisive a figure as you can imagine. Um, she ruled at the same time that Ronald Reagan ruled. They were very simpatico. Um, but Reagan, even though he was somebody that a lot of us maybe didn't think was as great a president as the Republicans obviously do, 
Um, he was not as divisive as she. And in part, that's because there was a, um, I think, because he seemed uh, human. <laughs> I don't know that she did. After I just said humans are complex. She was a piece of work. And um, I must say, as a feminist, that she did uh, make very clear to anybody who was paying any attention that a woman is fully capable of being as much of an SOB in running a country as a man and as tough and as unbending and all of that. So from a feminist perspective, I appreciate uh, the that lesson. Um, but if you were a working class person in... Great Britain, I seriously doubt whether you would uh, be mourning today. Uh, there's a, I, I want to just share with you a little that is in the, uh, the Mirror, which is, of course, a British newspaper. And the person writing it is desirous of ensuring that we remember certain things about Maggie. He says this, she decimated our basic industries of coal and steel. Shipbuilding virtually disappeared along with much of heavy engineering and all the jobs that went with it. She tried mightily to destroy our unions through repressive legislation, and she damn well near succeeded. She branded workers fighting for their jobs and communities as the enemy within, a foul slur on decent working people and their families for which she will never be forgiven. She made mass unemployment respectable and used as a tool of government. She said that uh, all the, the dole cues, the people waiting in line for welfare, were a price worth paying under her regime. She created a new underclass of jobless men, took away their status as breadwinners, and forced millions of their wives back into the workplace. If she was a woman's champion, I'm Meryl Streep. She sold our basic utilities, gas, water, electricity, and telephones, and prices soared. She flogged off the buses and railways, and fares went through the roof. She sold off the council houses, which I think are like, uh, uh, what do you call that? Um, like low-cost housing that the government builds. Uh, she sold off the council houses and built no new ones. So there are now more than 2 million families on housing waiting lists. She enthroned the profit motive and unleashed the speculators. She surrounded economic policy, she surrendered economic policy to the mysterious dark forces of the market, which has led the UK into one recession after another and into the mess where we are today. She imposed the hated poll tax on the nation. She then thrust it down, first in Scotland, then thrust it down the throats of the English, prompting the worst riots in London since the disturbances of the early 80s. She took us to war with Argentina over the Falkland Islands when her popularity was rock bottom. Um, that's interesting because you could say the same for Reagan when he went into Grenada. They, they borrowed from one another. Uh, she tied the nation's international policy like a tin can to the tail of the attack dog in the White House, Ronald Reagan, backing his outlandish Star Wars system, which came to nothing. She flirted obscenely with a racist apartheid regime in South Africa, opposing UN sanctions, and dismissing Nelson Mandela as a commie terrorist. She opposed the reunification of Germany. In Northern Ireland, she sanctioned a dirty war, faced down hunger strikers so that 10 of them died, 
and delayed the onset of the peace process that could have come earlier, but had to await the arrival of her successor, John Major. And let us not forget, she started it all many years earlier in the 70s by stealing school milk from children in her first cabinet post as education secretary. Now that she's gone, it's fashionable to say that whatever you think of Maggie, at least you have to admire her for sticking to her guns. I repudiate that. Look where she pointed those guns, at those who couldn't defend themselves, their jobs, their way of life, the pitmen, the steel workers, the rail employees, the hundreds of thousands of employees in state sector business thrown on the scrap heap in the name of privatized profits. Businesses now, like water and electricity, largely in the hands of foreign owners ripping off the British consumer. I lived through the Thatcher years as a London-based journalist when I, okay, I don't know. Anyway, so this is, um, okay, I'll get a little more of the, the meat here. I, I remember the despair in the inner cities that triggered riots, the hopelessness of the industrial communities devastated by her policies, and the social alienation caused by her me-first selfish individualism. All of this sounds... Now, you understand why Republicans in this country are in deep mourning, because uh, she is somebody who bought uh, their agenda totally and instituted it totally. And you must say that uh, Great Britain right now is not in the greatest of shape, but there have been things happening in the interim, I guess. Her own party threw her out. And that sometimes is forgotten. Um, if anyone is inclined to remind me that one should not speak ill of the dead, this, uh, uh, this person writes, and I, for some reason I can't see the author here. Um, let, me remind, let me remind them that she had nothing good to say about us while she was alive. Any man over 25 who traveled by bus was a failure, she once remarked. Dismissing at a stroke all working people who have to use public transportation. That was classic Thatcher from a woman who famously said, home is where you come to when you have nothing better to do. How many homes felt the lash of her winner-take-all view of the world, I wonder. Well, all right. Rest in profit, he ends it, Iron Lady. Wow. Okay, just a, just a reminder of um, <laughs> how there's, there's two sides to, uh, to this uh, story. Because I know, I know, the mainstream media and certainly the right-wing media is, is going to be going absolutely uh, bonkers uh, with her death. Uh, okay, I think that's it. Uh, Kathy's not here yet. I probably, maybe I should take a break right now and we'll assume Kathy, can, well, maybe I shouldn't. I'll wait until we see her. You think? Yeah. Poor Jess is under the weather. I'm looking over at somebody who looks not good, not good at all. Um, I didn't discuss on Friday, and I felt bad about not having noted it, the, the death of Roger Ebert, film critic, because I was um, a dedicated follower of his on Twitter. He was just, he was a remarkably prolific writer in any medium. <laughs> I mean... He was everywhere, and you couldn't read his stuff without getting the sense that this was a nice guy. Smart, nice guy. Regular guy. And I just want to quote from his memoir about death, and it's such a wonderful thing he wrote, and it makes me happy that, that he wrote it. 
I know it is coming, and I do not fear it, because I believe there is nothing on the other side of death to fear. I hope to be spared as much pain as possible on the approach path. I was perfectly content before I was born, and I think of death as the same state. I am grateful for the gifts of intelligence, love, wonder, and laughter. You can't say it wasn't interesting. My lifetime's memories are what I have brought home from the trip. I will require them for eternity, no more than that little souvenir of the Eiffel Tower I brought home from Paris. There's just this clear view, accepting view, grateful appreciation of life, but no expectation that death is something to be either, what, feared or looked forward to because he's going to heaven. He puts death, I think, in the same place. Well, that he puts death in the same place as the state we were before we were born, I think is wonderful. It's just a wonderful idea. And as he puts it, I was perfectly content before I was born. Wow. What a, what a. I'm taking that one home, and I'm taking a break. Stick around for more with Lynn Cullen Live after this. It's warming up outside, so get to Littles for all your spring needs. Littles has everything for men, women, and children to stay in style for this upcoming hot summer. Lots of great colors from Dansko, New Balance, Steve Madden, and much, much more. Don't forget to come visit this season's colorful handbag selection as well. Little Shoes, Pittsburgh's largest family shoe store, 5850 Forbes Avenue in Squirrel Hill. This week's Pittsburgh City Paper is available now. Pick up one today for a look at the Jewish Film Festival, plus Mercury Soul, Eric Clapton, and Mike Nesmith. Pittsburgh City Paper, available at over 1,700 locations throughout western Pennsylvania and on the web at pghcitypaper.com and on your smartphone at citypapermobile.com. Have a question or an opinion? Call Lynn Cullen at 412-316-3381 or email lynn at pghcitypaper.com. Now, more with Lynn Cullen Live. Uh, okay, hi, and I've now got uh, Kathy Newman with me. She's an associate? Yes. Produ- producer. <laughs> associate professor of English at Carnegie Mellon University. Thank you very much. I could have done that after you reassured me associate <laughs> was correct. More importantly, she's a mom. She's a mom of a little boy who's in what grade? Third grade. Third grade. And he's uh, attending the school my son attended. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's a wonderful school. Wonderful school. Been there, done that, whatever. Anyway, um, I'm going to, um, here, let me back this up just a little bit. Okay. Um, it's funny. You're one of two people that I know who in the last week created a major storm by writing something. Words still matter. Words matter. Isn't that something? It is. So you wrote an op-ed piece for the Post-Gazette that was on in Sunday's paper. Came out on Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday. And the other one I'm talking about is, a, is another East Ender, uh, a senior at Taylor Alderdice named Susie Weiss, hmm. who wrote a very clever op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal about not getting into the school she wanted to. I saw that. Did you see that? Right. And that caused a real firestorm. Um, but we don't want to go there. But it's interesting. So the both, both of you, living within a stone's throw of each other, both setting off these conflagrations by simply stating your opinion on something having to do with education. That's right. 
Though I don't think things go viral by accident. No, I would imagine not. So in the sense that I was, I mean, I've been involved in this education movement now for about 15 months. Uh, hundreds of parents were sort of propelled into action a year ago, last January, when the cuts from the billion-dollar cuts to education started to trickle down. Uh, we held rallies, mock bake st- sales, pretending to raise money from selling cookies to make up for the shortfall. At Linden, um, we had some of our science curriculum affected. We lost music. We lost third-grade band. Uh, the, the kids can only go to the library now once a week. Or, I'm sorry, once a month. What? Uh, what? Excuse me, I didn't mean to scare you. <laughs> what? Once a I month. used to volunteer in that library. I spent more time re I love that library. It's a fantastic what? library. Once? What? What? I helped digitalize it. You are kidding. My son excitedly told me last week that he can now check out two books when he goes instead of just one. So these budget cuts have been devastating across the state. And a lot of the poorest schools have been hit the hardest. I am just sick. Yeah. So many of us have been sort of on the edge of our seats, active, educated, watching. And then a few of us started thinking about uh, No Child Left Behind, the high-stakes testing that evaluates the schools, the way many of the schools do not make what's called adequate yearly progress. And so there is a national, basically civil disobedience movement to say, we're not going to let our kids take these tests because they're doing so much damage to the schools. Now, this is interesting. So you were just writing about you weren't going to have your boy take this PSS PSSA A, yeah which stands for Pennsylvania who knows what uh, and every state must have these kinds of things every state has its own test test and this test is given how often once a year once a year and a ton of stuff is riding on this test whether or not in fact a school gets to this, what was it, adequate? Adequate yearly progress. Adequate yearly progress. And in order to reach that level, what is it, 95%? Well, they need 95% participation. Okay, but how many kids have to, you're I don't, not sure I don't know do what the proficiency benchmark is now, but by 2014, at least from the original goals of No Child Left Behind, every public school in the country is supposed to be 100% proficient in math. What and a bunch of stuff. Absolute yeah. nonsense. Okay, so at the same time the government takes money away consistently from schools, ham, I mean, absolutely making it increasingly difficult for them to do their job of educating, they then stick these tests hanging over their head and said every, what, so by... They're saying every single student in the United States has to test at proficient or higher. Well, well, it's a, a laudable goal. It's but a can, laudable can goal. Can we get serious? It's, it's of course it's what we want. One of the one of the data points that I've seen that's really shocked me is that the biggest predictor for a child's performance on this or any other test is that child's zip code. Oh, you bet. And the education level of that oh. child's parents. Oh, big, big shock. Okay. So, in other words, whether a child succeeds is not about the biggest factor is not the teacher. The teacher. Or the school. Not, or even the school. Teachers have 10 to 15% kind of wiggle room of influence. Where a child lives is huge because if you live in a depressed area or maybe a rural, if you live in a poor area, if you don't have a lot of money in the area, socioeconomically, your odds of being, I don't know, of being well-educated are not... Of testing well. Okay, of testing well are not good. If you don't have parents at home who were successful in education... Uh, your I, odds are again. You know what? I have a flexible job. <laughs> How don't they understand this? I, here's where I first when I when 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 my son went to Linden, I was blown away as a first time parent of what the schools actually were expecting of me. Because when I went to school, 
back in the 50s. <laughs> My parents had nothing whatsoever to do with anything. They locked the door and made you play outside all day. That's right. And you went off to school and you came back. If you had homework, you did it. Your parents didn't do it. They didn't even know half the time what classes you were taking. It was not of, it, it just, sorry. They just said, okay, go to school. All right, come in. Uh, school, come on, come on. Now, I was blown away by how I was, he had to come home with all this stuff, and this had to be superintended. There's no way that a kid in kindergarten or first grade is going to attend to this. And I thought, good Lord. So I'm being forced to be part of this education. This is what I thought. Well, fine, I can do that. But then, I, you look at the makeup of the school, and you know some of those children go home to absolute dysfunction and chaos. There's nobody there to do what you would do or I would do for our children. And that's the teacher's fault? Oh my God, I just, you know what? I, the stu- I'm sorry, the stupidity of it. So these poor kids who already have, a, they've got so many uh, deficits to have to deal with, so many mountains to climb, and you just make it harder and harder. You pull money from out from under them and then you insist that they produce more. That's right. What kind of insanity is afoot here? The the article got so many positive responses from retired teachers, some teachers who are right now in the trenches. They told stories of kids being so nervous during the test to ask to go to the bathroom that they sat there and wet their pants. This teacher from Florida told the story of a little girl who opened her test, was so nervous she threw up all over her test but still had to go forward the, with the exam because it had been opened. Just, I mean, sto- So the kids pick up on how, I mean, they know how important this is, huh? They do. I mean, there are teachers who are saying that they actually think that the, that the stress that is put on the student, because it's not about that student's ability or performance for him or herself. It's about that score for the school. And the, the kids know that? They do. There's sometimes there's pep rallies. I got a robo call this weekend saying make sure you get your child to bed early, feed them a healthy breakfast. I mean maybe do the we- rest of the year who <laughs> cares? They could be in the street till three a.m. and no breakfast as usual. But no, for our test. Okay, so this is what No Child Left Behind begot. That's right. Uh, and what your piece said was. My kid's not going to take the test. We're not going to do it this year. Okay. Now, you did that for him or you did that to make a point? Really both. I I mean, I have been struggling with that homework albatross all year. And the reading homeworks that are specifically geared to the PSSA have been very advanced. Yes, because we get weekly practice tests back every week with a grade. And so then I can see where the homeworks are just like the tests. Okay. You, you need, a, we have a caller. You have to put that headphone on. Hello, caller. Go ahead. Hello. Hi. Hi. What? I'm calling in about the um, high stakes testing. Oh, out. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Am I? You're on. I, oh, I'm on. Hi. Hi. Go hey, ahead. Pamela. Um. I just wanted to add to what Dr. Newman is saying. I opted my son out. He's in fourth grade at Liberty, which is another um, magnet school in the same area. My understanding is, though, that the only way you can opt out is for the only reason is for religious purposes. Right, and we've been getting a lot of flack about that, actually. You mean because you Um, guys just found religion of a certain sort all of a sudden? Any religion, any humanism, you know, no matter what. I actually have a religion, Yeah. and I do pay dues to a congregation, um, but I can't imagine anybody saying that um, a religion wouldn't back social justice or a religion wouldn't back... Um, harming a child in ways that are not intended, right? So yeah. this test 
Um, You're saying it, okay, so. it offends your basic uh, principles. The uh, uh, spiritual humanism, social okay. justice. Okay. And and the my understanding is the schools once you say that they can't like uh, give you trouble about it. They That's have to accept right. it. So what? There's a movement afoot then to get more and more parents just to say I won't do it because if enough parents were to do this, it would scuttle the whole system, right? Is that true? Eventually, yeah. I think it. I mean, if enough parents opted out, it would invalidate a lot of these results. I mean, so it's a message, sort of. At a, at a smaller local level to the districts and the schools that have to carry this out, but the the larger audience hopefully is is our is our elected representatives. Do you worry, uh, caller and 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 Kathy, that the school will uh, you know somehow take it out on your children for creating you know this inconvenience? Dirt? Yeah, yeah. Trouble. Do you worry about it? What do you think, Pamela? No, actually, my school has been um, very accommodating, and I've had teachers pull me aside and tell me, "Keep going." I've had this, I've had the same they response. See what's happening? So I I actually wrote an opt out letter where I talked about um, two things with teachers, but one of them, which I thought was really interesting, there's a teacher that teaches science in the gifted center. She told me that her kids have to write a hypothesis before the class starts. And these kids are afraid to write anything because they want to make sure their hypothesis is correct because we're in this environment where you can't be wrong. Oh, my God. And you know, I can't think of anything worse for education. You're in an absolutely. environment where you can't be wrong being wrong. I mean, you can't. How can anybody learn if they're afraid of being wrong? You That's can't. a great question. You can't. Oh, my God. Oh, God. Help us. Keep us from these right. idiots. All right. You so know, I want to bring... Go ahead. I want to bring up another point. Great Schools has this um, online thing, and I, it just came out in the paper today, I think, about the, the school's ratings and, you know, which district has the best schools. It's called Great I moved Schools. Here. GreatSchools.org, I think. Yeah, Great, GreatSchools.org. Yeah. I moved here six years ago and had to pick up a school for my child, mm -hmm. and I looked at those ratings, and Linden is rated three, by the way, out of five, ten, whatever. It's rated as a bad school, and um, Dr. Newman, one of the comments that I saw on your Washington Post article was, why would a professor pick such a failing school for her child? Well, we all know that Linden is not a failing school. We both but picked, I, my child went to Linden, too. Yeah. Right. Well, I... That's bull. Well, the rating is what? based on the test scores. Okay, the, the rating test is scores. based on test scores. And so are we going to hold places like that accountable? Are we going to hold A plus schools, for instance, accountable for putting out a report to the community based on test scores? And can we explain that? I mean, it's not. Linden had is a. It has its share of incredible teachers and yeah teachers and medium teachers, just like any school does. What differentiates itself, perhaps, from a school in suburbia is it has a population that is also coming from uh, poverty. From all over the city. All over the city and as a magnet. with right. Yeah, that's right. And it's got an economically diverse population, a racially diverse population, and it's got parents that are so motivated, so dedicated. I mean, there are parents, sometimes myself included, who are there hours a day every week. Oh, I, Mike Tomlin sent his kids to Linden. His son just won Linden's first spelling bee this year. Way to go! <laughs> but, I mean, yeah. so why would a college professor and a football coach in the NFL who must be paid God knows what, why would he not send his child to a private school? So I, I just think that these community organizations also need to be, um, you know, held accountable and say, look, there's more to us than just the test score. And, these, and by putting so much weight on these test scores, look at the things that are happening. Okay, so what what ends up happening, caller, thank you, by the way, for the call. I just want to, Kathy, what ends up happening when the this test is coming up and it's, it's going to be taken in a month? Does it start up that 
much in advance where all of a sudden the curriculum seems to change a little and what you see coming home changes and they're already just teaching to that test? When I, I, I've seen the practice tests all year, so I've kind of been monitoring them. Jacob's doing okay. He's like in the 70s, low 80s um, on those practice tests. In January and February, we saw a lot more of these reading homeworks that were very specifically geared to the reading portion of the PSSA, because I could see the practice tests and see the homeworks. And so there were nights in January, February, and March where Jacob and I spent between two and three hours together after school. And sometimes I had trouble with the answers. Ha! Oh, God. I would get excited. I'd be like, oh, I got that one right. And then I'd be like, I'm 46 and I have a PhD. This is a third grade. And I'm excited because I just got a, something right <laughs> wow. on my kids' homework. It's just wrong. It's just not how we should be spending our time. Or they should be spending yeah. their time. Yeah. What nonsense. My, my son says, I just want to be a kid. Aw. See, I don't remember feeling that stress, but that was before No Child Left Behind. Yeah. No Child Left Behind. What a... Oh, my God. We haven't been able to rename the law, among, among, among other problems. I can think of lots of names that would be more, uh, more, more apt. Um, Okay, so this test is coming up when? Do all schools it start, get it? It started today for third graders. Okay, so today there's a bunch of kids puking on their papers. And uh, and so where's Jacob when the whole class is doing this? He is helping in his younger sister's class. My daughter, Casey Ann, is in kindergarten. And her teacher very graciously said, I can put him to work. Yeah. Oh, my God. So... Were you um, off in Washington, D.C.? Um, I did. There, there's a, there's there. a national movement that sort of aggregates the parents and the educators who are speaking out about this. It's called, this year it was called Occupy the DOE, and sort of opt out was the theme. Department of Education. Depar yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so we stood right in front of the Department of Education. Um, we got there around noon on Friday, and Karen Lewis was speaking, who'd led the Chicago teacher strike last fall. And she was able to connect her, her teacher's strike to the upcoming plan to close 50 schools in Chicago based on a lot of these, you know, using this data. Oh, that that's say, how they target schools. To say which schools are failing. And I read a study this morning that said um, when a school was closed in Chicago a few years ago, 10% of the students were homeless at that school. Well, don't... Okay, so... I. Far from it for me to be a conspiracy theorist, but this just seems like an obvious. It's part of you see these other these other factors. Part of a factor to literally destroy public education. It's what it feels like on the ground. I, I don't. Think it I does don't too. know if there's somebody up there with a map and a plan and a blueprint. What but do you mean? You've already got. You've already got. These uh, these big companies taking over education, you know, they want to privatize everything. Well, here in Pennsylvania, it's especially true because Tom Corbett's top four donors are for-profit cyber school investors. There you go. There you go. Something Chris Potter likes pointing out. Do we have a caller? Hello. 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 Uh, Lynn, I'm really loving this um, talk you're having right now. And a, a friend of mine, she's a retired teacher now. She was nearly in tears when they came out with this No Child Left Behind. What I don't understand, and I don't mean to interject logic into any of this. <laughs> God forbid. But what I don't understand is how, how if you want to improve things, you take money away from it. Yeah. Everything runs on money. These school districts run on money. And, and it's like, okay, well, you're not performing, so we'll take resources away from you and expect you to do more it's the biblical uh, bricks without straw mm -hmm. it really is and and i've seen this in other things but this this one affects it affects our future yep it really does you know the, the old indian proverb if you want to see your future look at your children and uh so hey listen uh, to the the lady sitting beside you god bless you and i hope there's a million more of you. 
Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. So, yeah, there is an effort to scuttle public education to turn it over to the private sector. And one of the ways you would do that is actually by going after these uh, poorer schools, right? They're the ones you can get because the, right off the bat, you can just knock them off. I mean, I, I think that's right. I think one of the things that's so disturbing about charters, and not all charter schools are bad, not all charter schools are the same, but ultimately it is a private corporation that's controlling taxpayer money. And, yes, and it, it bleeds money away from the public's. And there, public schools. There's also um, a number of Catholic schools in the city that um, add on to the district's gifted program, for example. I don't have all the statistics for it, but there's already quite a bit of taxpayer money going to some private schools uh, through education credits. Um, there, we're overpaying charter schools. Taxpayer money is actually reimbursing them for more than it costs them per student to educate. So uh, we've got some active education members in the middle of the state who have really kind of taken on cyber, cyber charter school uh, sort of funding formulas as an issue, something that we could legislate now that could pull millions of dollars back into the, to the state coffers for education. Uh, Corbett insists he didn't take money from schools. This is obviously one of the most frustrating things that we're dealing with. Um, as Rendell was going out and Obama stimulus was coming in, the legislature had just voted to change the funding formula so that it was equal across districts instead of the funding formula that Corbett took us back to, which actually pays richer schools more and poorer schools less. I, I, oh, okay, it does, doesn't it? It, it does. It does. Now, what possible, what possible explana explanation can the governor or his uh, education secretary have for that? So, in other words, Upper St. Clair will get more money than Duquesne. Exactly. Yeah. How I, do you, I mean, do, how, have you ever heard them explain how their form, <laughs> their wonderful formula, what I, I've How never you... I've never seen a justification of it in print, um, but Rendell's administration, along with the legislatures at the time, were trying to fix this, and they did make tremendous progress on early education. Bill and Marty Eisler were a huge part of that. So we were we were making some steps in the right direction. Now that stimulus money was used for education. But it was used to replace tax money that had already been going to education. Okay. So it wasn't like there was this big balloon payment that then disappeared when the stimulus was gone. It was money that had already, already been, been budgeted yeah. for education yeah. because of this bump that everyone had agreed to, to put into the system. We also have done the math. We've looked at all the budgets to show that Corbett's budget was, I think, around four or five hundred thousand, four or five hundred million less than what Rendell had had been putting in before the stimulus. Matt Smith, wonderful state legislator, and uh, Matt Lebanon has done this math. So we've got the math, but we don't have the PR machine to keep our message out there. So the very first thing that Tim Eller wrote in response to my editorial. And who's Tim, Tim Eller? Oh, I'm sorry. He's the PR um, spokesperson for the Pennsylvania Department of Education. The first thing he said was, we didn't cut education funding. That's right. So then why did we lose 20,000 teachers in Pennsylvania over the last two years? Indeed. Furloughed. Gone. Yeah. Lost. All of a sudden they couldn't get paid. So how did that happen? Yeah. So they're just lying through their teeth. Or engaging in a, a a little semantic and budgetary trick or sleight of hand. Even Corbett has admitted there's a few places. He's on Dom Giordano's show in Philadelphia about once a month. And he said, if you listen to my words, I'm always talking about basic education funding. So even he has kind of admitted that. But yeah, it's been it's been hard to get traction on this because... The governor's office was successful in getting out this idea that the stimulus came in, the stimulus rolled out, and our schools were hurt as a result, as opposed to decisions that state legislatures Why isn't this something, you know, rather than the PTA? Why can't this be something the PTA does? The teachers would be generally for it. The parents, once educated, should be for it. And literally, if you simply everybody gets religion and opts out, 
It stops this craziness, wouldn't it? I mean, that's just massive civil disobedience. I love it. And what a great lesson for the children. Yes, uh, no? What? I, I mean, I, I, I'm optimistic. I'm wired to be optimistic. So I see there's a tipping point. I think that the mood is shifting. I think that the number of people who are already willing to participate in this is some kind of a signal. So I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. I have to admit, I was nervous going to school this morning. I had to talk to the principal. I was scared. Well, you know, I, just about where Jacob was going to be during the test. You were and, afraid the principal would really start screaming I mean, at you. I, I'm a troublemaker, but I'm not naturally a rule breaker. I understand. It, it, this That's is, what me, I am too. I follow the rules, but I'm a troublemaker. Yeah, yeah so you don't want to deal with the I, I th- anger. I think this is a good way to draw attention to a bad system. Mm-hmm. But I think we're going to need other forms of activism. I think we're going to need to make this a policy question for our elected officials. You know, we need to sort of deal with it in Washington, D.C. Oh, it, God, help I know, us. I know. Diane Ravage, wonderful educator who used to be on the side of reform and charters, is coming out with a book in the fall called Hoax. She started a wonderful new organization called the Network for Public Education. She's got a lot of the top educators in the country signed on to it. So, I, I mean, I see the ground shifting away from these regulations. What can the Obama administration do? They haven't done much. Huh? Fire Arnie Duncan. Really? You really don't like Arnie Duncan? I, he just comes out of the same mentality that it's all about the teacher, that testing shows where the weaknesses are. Um, Did it, 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 he, he's... A, he is no different from the Democrats and Republicans who put this law into place under Bush. Okay. Uh, don't know if you saw this uh, piece written by an English teacher at North Allegheny Senior High School yesterday, David Morris. It was a forum piece, and I'm not, I, I can't even, I just pulled a little <laughs> bit out. But he, he's talking about being a teacher. And what a teacher's about. And he's talking about these statewide teacher evaluation systems and how there's no way they are going to accurately uh, let you know who's a good teacher and who isn't. And he says teaching is far more art than science, right? And the fundamental task of a teacher is to engage a child. And by in, in engaging a child, a very important aspect of that is style, is how you do it, um, such as, and he says, techniques that would resist any kind of measurement by a test include humor, surprise, suspense, encouragement, and calculated criticism. To teach is to perform, and central to the performance is empathy. The best teachers are mind readers. They are working with the audience, their students, and working off them. No, no test is gonna measure the ability of a teacher like that to put fire in a kid's imagination. I think I've sort of rediscovered my faith in teachers through this process. I, I've followed this wonderful website called The Art of Learning, and Matt Damon had a meme that went viral where he was talking about the teachers that had meant the most to him and how they'd inspired him and how there was nothing about what they did that could have been tested, tested either in him so true. Or, or in them. I, my favorite Good for him. high school teacher, I'm friends with her on Facebook, and she let me dress up once and do a performance as the great granddaughter of Alexander Graham Bell. And so I talked about his discoveries, but I did, you know, I like put makeup on and wore a wig and acted like an old lady. I mean, it's very, I, I mean, when I look back on it, I'm almost embarrassed for myself because it's so corny. But I still remember how the telephone was invented, and I went on to become a radio historian. Like, this was obviously something that was deep in my DNA, that I was interested in communication technology as a junior in high school. And she let that creativity come out of me. 
there was no test of like of Alexander Graham Bell and I I mean <laughs> this was something I wanted to do. Yeah. So. Oh. These this is what happens when you let bureaucrats uh and their their propensity for what reducing everything to measurement and 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 graphs and you let them take control. This is horrific. I so commend you for what you've done, and I, I, I commend you even more knowing that you were afraid to go to school today. <laughs> well, I mean... Do you think Jacob was afraid? He's, he seemed okay. Uh, oh. You know, I mean, this is just that fundamental fear, right? You're always afraid of going to the principal's office. That's right. That never That's changes. No, it never does. It was easier... To to write in something that appeared in the Post Gazette and in the Washington Post than it was to talk to our very wonderful principal, Miss Burgess, this morning. Well, I'm sh- maybe it, you know she wouldn't admit it, but maybe Miss Burgess likes what you did too. She she was a little upset because I did kind of overstate the number of things that had been taken off the walls, and I I did apologize to her this morning. Not everything has come down off the walls. You said that as they headed into testing, they actually took stuff down from the walls in the school and put up what? The rules say there can be nothing on the walls in the hallways or the classroom what? that might give an answer on the test. What? So... You know, charts, tables, multiplication, you know, chemistry. So they literally have to strip things off. Or they cover them. Okay, which again, if you're a kid and that's your school and your environment is being screwed with by that, it just creates unbelievable anxiety. So I did have to acknowledge as I looked around this morning, there were still some things up on the walls. But I know at Colfax, where the testing goes on for longer periods because it goes up to eighth grade, that sort of more warehouse feeling to the school can last for up to two months. And I had a teacher write me to tell me that she'd had to cover up the clock in her classroom because it was considered a number line. So just the extremes that people are having to go to so they won't be accused of cheating. You know, look at Atlanta. Well, and that and that's the thing. You set this kind of thing up, and there'll be people who cheat. You set this. It is an absurdity, and we're creating. All it does is hurt the schools. It's only hurting the schools. Consequently, hurting the students, and all in the name of helping them. It's just. It is so unbelievably grotesque. It's it's unbelievable. I'm glad I'm not a parent now because I would be ballistic. I would be losing my mind. You know, there's there's wonderful parents in Pittsburgh, southwestern PA, and across the country who feel the same way. So we're not alone. We're organized. We're talking to each other. We're doing things. Good. It's it's been a it, it's what been organiza- a very- what, what should people? Is there a website for people to go to to get more? information absolutely about, okay, the, the movement here in in southwestern P- pa aggregates at something called yinzer spelled just like you'd yinzer cation yinzer cation yeah so it's education plus yinzer is yinzer cation dot org uh, dot wordpress dot what com wordpress it's a wordpress blog so it's yinzer cation dot wordpress dot com dot wordpress dot com and it's uh Written and monitored by Jesse Ramey, who's a who's a professor of history and women's studies at University of Pittsburgh. She's got two kids at Colfax. She started this blog in January of 2012. Again, it started around these state issues, mm-hmm. but she she started blogging and sort of bringing opt out into the conversation earlier this year, 2013. And um, we're also uh, in connect, we're in communication with a guy named Tim Slecker, and it's S-L-E-K-A-R, and he's got something called At the Chalk Face. Um, He's got a radio show where he raises a lot of these issues. He's become a national leader of the opt-out movement. He opted his kid out three years ago and sort of went viral in a similar way. He was on CNN. He was one of the first people in the country to do it. So he's a Penn State <clears throat> Altoona education professor. Um, and then Diane Ravitch's blog, I think, is probably one of the best blogs out there for the national movement. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Kathy Newman, parent and professor and 
agitator. She can't help herself. I really can't. Thank you, Lynn. It's <laughs> wonderful you. to talk with you. we got to get a break in, and we'll be right back. More is on the way with Lynn Cullen Live. Go to BargBargains.com for great deals on gift cards from your favorite local restaurants, bars, museums, and shows. This week only, get discounts up to 30% for Tamari. BargBargains.com, Pittsburgh's best bargains. BargBargains.com. Confusion ever someone or have sudden... Have you ever had sudden confusion, trouble speaking, or understanding someone? It could be one of the five signs of stroke. Sudden weakness or numbness of the face, arm, or leg. Sudden trouble with vision in one or both eyes. Suddenly having trouble walking or difficulty with balance. Or a sudden intense headache that comes out of nowhere. Don't wait. Call 911 immediately. Time lost is brain lost. Find out more at PowerToEndStroke.org. Brought to you by the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association, and the Ad Council. You're listening to Lynn Cullen Live at PGHCityPaper.com. Once again, here's Lynn Cullen. Oh, Kathy was just saying that her son's teacher is the same teacher my son had, who has to be about the most wonderful teacher in the universe. It's a shout out to Mr. Bowman at Linden School. He figures large in my um, in my son's life. When he was the first male teacher my son had, and I was very excited about him having a male teacher because he doesn't have a father at home, and I just thought seeing and Mr. Bowman is a an ex marine. He's a, a tough looking wonderful man. And my son was terrified of him, just terrified. And he was vomiting before he went to school. He was so scared. Because Mr. Bowman, like, you know, you be quiet, you this, you that. And he, Sam had never dealt with a male being like that. And I think he was such a wreck. And finally, and I knew Mr. Bowman, and I knew him to be a nice man. So I did finally, I called him, and I said, I just want you to know that Sam is, he's terrified of you. And I, you could have, it was like I punched Mr. Bowman in the gut. He was so upset. And... He said, I will, I, thank you, thank you for telling me, I will take care of this. I don't know what he did. I don't know, he didn't cha- stop being Mr. Bowman. But to this day, my son loves him. To this day, I think that's the only teacher that he like holds up as. And after he went off to college, he, the only time he ever, he said, I'm going to walk over to Linden and see Mr. Bowman. And I mean, that teacher, Mr. Bowman, thank God he's still there, was a huge, huge, huge force in my son's life. And none of what Mr. Bowman did with my son could possibly be measured by these fucking tests, these stupid tests. So, anyway, it's so, it it is so upsetting when you realize how the idiots just continue to screw things up. So that's what, uh, it's a, you know, George Bush, with the help of a lot of Democrats, I think Ted Kennedy was with him on that. No child left behind, as I recall. So I, I, this opt-out movement is, uh, I think, brilliant. And I, because it will eventually draw, as if it starts... Uh, up in schools all over the country. It's eventually going to draw a lot of attention. 
uh, because the schools, as as Kathy mentioned, have to have 95 percent of the children taking the tests or they don't count. And if you don't have 95 percent of the kids taking the test, then you're not going to make that important list, that AYP, uh, which is what? A- adequate, adequate yearly progress. And so if you put the schools in the position of, you know, ending up essentially failing the test because the parents are rebelling against it, you've got a system that ceases to, uh, to function. And I think that's, uh, that's why what Kathy Newman has done and what other, the other caller and other parents in the country is, uh, is brilliant civil disobedience. And again, a great lesson. Her son is learning more about politics, about principle, about courage, about not uh, necessarily, you know, doing all the time what you're told if it offends a basic principle that you hold dear. Um, I think it's just great stuff, great stuff, and I, I commend her thoroughly. Um, Gigi writes, I came in late to the show because I was at a meeting at my son's school this morning. I can't wait to hear the podcast of the whole show. I'm so appreciative of you having this guest today. This is an issue that resonates with me and many parents who I know. Whom I know. Good, good. Uh, get active then. And again, the uh, uh, make sure that your this Yinzerkation uh, blog is smart, smart as heck. These women, many of them academics themselves, with children in the public schools, and in the public schools because they value the very idea of public education. Something the Republicans have been working overtime to devalue for years. I had the money to send my child to Shaney Sign Academy or Winchester Thurston or all the other schools. I couldn't have done that. It's against my principles. Public education is where you meet and mix. It's where democracy uh, is, is, is emboldened because you're not with your own kind. You're with all kinds. It's why I wouldn't live in the suburbs. You need to mix. There's not a greater education a child can have than, than, than playing and, and learning with children from totally different backgrounds. And I'm not talking necessarily ethnic or religious. I'm talking about kids who live in some, you know, uh, hovel somewhere. And kids who live in mansions. And they come together. This forced separation of children uh, by socioeconomic class is re- Impulsive to me. Kathy Newman could send her kids somewhere else. This other, you know, it, 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 is, it is so true. And as I said, Mike Tomlin made a statement when he moved into the neighborhood and sent his kids to the public school. A failing School. What bull? Check it out. Yinzercation dot wordpress dot com. I'm sure if you just Google Yinzercation, you'll get there too. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. I was very emotional today, but that's just because uh, Maggie Thatcher's dead. Ding dong. <laughs> It's not nice of me, and I'll burn in hell for that. Toodaloo.
Lynn Cullen Live, Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. and archived at pghcitypaper.com. The opinions expressed on Lynn Cullen Live are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the viewpoints of Pittsburgh City Paper, Steel City Media, and its advertisers.